right, everyone, well, it's two o'clock. So I think we should go ahead and dive in. Um, but before we do, I have a couple of housekeeping items to just quickly cover. So before we get started, um, just a reminder that all of our sessions are being recorded and the chats are being recorded as well. So we're gonna ask that everyone please abide by our uh, Passport Code of Conduct and I will drop a link to the Code of Conduct in the chat. Um, when you're in the session, you will be muted. And if, for those who need it, uh, closed captioning is available. You can uh, start it on your Zoom settings, your Zoom audio settings. Um, if you have any questions, we have an FAQ section on our site and in our socio platform. We also have a help desk available and we have a line available at 202-588-6100 for those who need it. Um, and with that, I will hand this over to our panelists. So, hello everyone. My name is Brent Legs. I'm the executive director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I wanna welcome you to the 13th annual meeting for the African American Preservationist Meeting. It's an honor to spend the next 50 minutes with you talking about the opportunity out of a moment of crisis. This is also an opportunity for us to all celebrate the successes and the leadership of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. So before I provide a brief presentation, I want to welcome my colleagues, Lawana Holland Moore and Brianna Rhodes, who will speak after me. And our hope is to continue our format for anyone that's participated in a previous meeting. The idea is to create space for us to have a dialogue and exchange about issues and opportunities impacting the Black preservation movement in the United States. And we hope that we can still curate that kind of conversation and exchange with you. And before I talk about the Action Fund, I again just want to highlight that we started this meeting around a conference table at the St. Paul National Conference in 2007. This, that moment created the blueprint for all of the diversity programming that we see today. And we at the National Trust are exceptionally pleased that the African American preservation work that we first started by creating the Rosenwald Schools Initiative in 2003 really has set the blueprint for our broader diversity preservation work across the country. Now you all know that the Action Fund was created in the aftermath of Charlottesville in 2017. These three images demonstrate how some Americans express their cultural values in public space, values of hate and racism. We created the Action Fund to demonstrate that preservation could provide leadership and that we could shift national consciousness and in essence, begin the process of reconstructing our national identity. We hope that this work begins to foster truth, healing and reconciliation. The Action Fund is a movement to redefine a new American narrative and culture. In essence, we are building a true national identity that reflects our country's diversity to create a more equitable and just society. Preservation today, contemporary preservation is a tool for social justice. We wanted to build a new team of leaders, esteemed leaders that's part of our National Advisory Council. This is a 20 member board of the, Nash, of the Action Fund, which is co-chaired by Darren Walker, who's the president of the Ford Foundation 
and actor and director, Miss Felicia Rashad. And if you look at these faces, these luminaries, Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, the first African American to chair the history department of Harvard University and the national president of the Association for the Study of African Life and History, the organization founded by Carter G. Woodson, or the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Dr. Lonnie Bunch. They are advising us and supporting us in the work to preserve 150 Black history sites across the country. So the Action Fund was created as a five-year, $25 million campaign, largest campaign ever undertaken on behalf of African American historic places by the National Trust. And I'm proud to say that in under three years, we have raised more than $24 million. And we are building a new community of, of partnerships and support and shifting the role of philanthropy in the United States towards preservation as racial justice. We also are leveraging our media engagement to amplify this work and the amazing, beautiful and complex culture of Black America through these kinds of publications. Now I wanna highlight our view of preservation as equity and activism. So you probably know that the signature pillar of the Action Fund is our national grant program. Over the last three grant rounds, we've received almost 2000 proposals requesting nearly $200 million. I'm glad to say that we have supported 65 preservation projects nationally and invested almost $5 million in sites of black resilience, activism and achievement and so much more. These numbers affirm that African American historic places have been undervalued and underfunded, and we are working to mitigate disinvestment in African American cultural assets. We also are working across our National Trust Historic Sites portfolio. I hope that you have seen the rubric on teaching slavery interpretation and descendant engagement, which we hope becomes a national model for the field and brings communities together to talk about these issues. We're also exploring across some of our historic sites, this idea of shared governance and authority, which we hope will also be a national model for the stewardship and interpretation of traditional historic sites like James Madison's Montpelier. We're working at non-traditional sites to advance this idea of equitable interpretation and to reveal the often overlooked and hidden narratives of, of Black identity embedded in these kinds of stories. And we're working with artists who can help reimagine the interpretation of this history. We have worked across 11 national treasure campaigns at places like Shaco Bottom in Richmond, Virginia, once the second largest slave holding center in the United States. We are proud to have partnered with the local community and grassroots advocates to develop a community driven vision for memorialization, economic development and education. And this is the vision that the Richmond community has for reactivating this, this cultural landscape in the heart of, of Richmond, Virginia. Many of you have seen news about our partnership and project at the Nina Simone Child at Home in Tryon, North Carolina. You probably are aware that four New York City visual artists as a form of arts activism and politics would create an LLC, save the house from demolition, formed a partnership with the National Trust and we have worked with other national partners like the World Monuments Fund, Preservation North Carolina, recently protected the property in perpetuity by using a preservation easement 
longest, the strongest legal tool possible to protect historic places. And we are finalizing plans to develop a stewardship plan for this site. We're doing this to honor the voice of the American Civil Rights Movement and the legend known as Miss Nina Simone. We are inspired by the awe and beauty and history of our more than 100 historically black colleges and universities. We have piloted through our whole crew program a, a, a preservation and practicum where we partnered with Morgan State University and Tuskegee University, introducing students in their school of design preservation theory where they learn that at the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, they come back and apply those skills on a real world project on their campus. And we believe that this is the pipeline for the next generation of black professionals in preservation. We also have just piloted a $1 million HBCU cultural heritage stewardship initiative. This is in partnership with the National Endowment for Humanities, the Kaplan Fund and other partners and we will partner with up to eight HBCUs, fund two campus-wide preservation plans and up to six individual building plans. And our goal is to equip HBCUs with the knowledge to steward the most remarkable collection of historic buildings, arguably anywhere in the world. I hope that you have seen our latest research report that was released on October 15th. It's called Preserving African-American Places, Growing Preservation Potential as a Path for Equity. We studied 10 mid-sized and major markets with historically black African-American neighborhoods. And you can see some of the statistics on the right, but it has affirmed that the disinvestment that we're fighting disinvestment, that we're still fighting issues of urban renewal, that we are fighting to retain our cultural assets and fighting against de demolition and the issues that disproportionately impact black historic neighborhoods and communities. We're working to create space for new voices and for new ideas. And we've established a fellowship program these are four of the newest cohorts. You're here from Brianna Rhodes in a minute. Kendacy Taylor, she is the author of a green book that came out last year and is working with us to identify 10 Harlem-based green book sites that are eligible for listing in the National Register. Yoruba Richin is producing a short doc on the story of preserving the home of John and Alice Coltrane in New York. And Jenna Dublin is a co-author of the equity research report that I just mentioned. And then there is another component of Hope Crew. It's our intro to preservation trades. We are working with diverse youth, introducing them to the history that surrounds them, places like Nina Simone's house where a small team of paid craft workers would paint the exterior of Nina Simone's house. We see this as an opportunity to, to build a pipeline for the next generation of qualified preservation craft professionals in the field of preservation. We also are committed to building the organizational capacity of site directors across the United States. And over the last three years, we've worked with 25 nonprofit organizations building their capacity in preservation planning, nonprofit management and fundraising. And this was the cohort at our convening in Maryland. And last, we were, we convened our very first Cultural Preservation Leadership Summit, a two-day event in March of 2018. It was co-sponsored by the Ford Foundation Center for Social Justice. We had an elegant affair the night before at the historic Apollo Theater. Elizabeth Alexander recited poetry. Went Marsalis played for us 
they had a stimulating conversation and we look forward over the next couple of years to bring all of you together in the next Cultural Preservation Leadership Summit to discuss the opportunities before us to amplify this important work. And then last, and for anyone that is unmuted, please mute your, your microphone. So last, I just wanna say that we are committed to securing new and equitable investment with, through our federal government to diversify National Park Service programs. You might not know that the National Park Service can't lobby and advocate for itself. The National Trust plays this leadership role. And I'm glad to say that since 2015, we have secured almost $100 million in partnership with Congresswoman Terry Sewell, Congressman James Clyburn, and other congressional members to establish the Underrepresented Communities Grant Program, the Civil Rights and HBCU Grant Programs, and the Civil Rights and Re Reconstruction Era Networks. This is preservation activism and equity. So I'm gonna leave you with this. So during the Black Lives Matter protest movement he here in DC this summer, an unnamed protester would write these words on the side of the Decatur House in the shadows of the White House. The Decatur House is a National Trust historic site operated by the White House Historical Association. It's a space where enslaved Americans were once held in bondage. And the question states, why do we have to keep telling you Black Lives Matter? This is why the Action Fund is so important because we continue to use this as a platform to fight for justice, to honor our ancestors and to reimagine preservation practice in the United States. You received just a sampling of our work. And, and again, I wanted to share this with you because I want you to celebrate with us for doing what has yet to be imagined for setting that blueprint for the other diversity communities that will follow the action fund. And together, we can transform the American cultural landscape, secure new investment, create new partnerships, and build a national ethic for the preservation of African American history and our historic places. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lawana Holly Moore. Thanks, Brent. You know, one thing you have to think about when we talk about African American history is the fact that it is American history and that our sites are tangible connections to our past and to that history. And for that reason, it makes it so important to be able to save them, to be able to preserve them, to be able to take care of them, to be able to be their stewards. Um, we at the Action Fund hope to draw attention to the remarkable and still largely unrecognized collections of places and stories of African-American activism and achievement. And through the elevation of those stories, we help to contribute to that collective narrative, which is our American history. And uh, this year for our national grant program, we just wrapped up year three of our grant cycle and awarded $1.6 million to 27 African-American historic sites, organizations nationwide in four categories, capital projects, programming and interpretation, project planning and organizational capacity. And we have awarded a total of $4.3 million in funding to 65 sites and organizations so that they may accomplish their goals. Um, over the, the past three years, I've had a chance to really see the breadth of um, needs of African-American preservation nationwide, and there is a need. And this year, for instance, we 
received five, over 500 um, LOIs, for, with over 470 of them being eligible. And what it is, is that once we receive them, they undergo an evaluation process and are narrowed down to those 50 that we invite for a full application. And of those evaluators, <laughs> we have external reviewers as well from Harvard's Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research, um, Asala, Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And once those applications, are, we whittle them down even more. And that's how we um, determine our final awardees. And I like to tell everybody, and many of you that have talked to me know I, I say this all the time, that it is extremely competitive, but you have a chance. And in order to do so, you have to put in. And the call for LOIs, for letters, letters of intent, is almost always the very beginning of December, around December 3rd or so. So please definitely check our website around that time to uh, find out more information about it. Um, also, um, I'm, hold, I'm holding a grant session tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, about best practices in terms of applying for an action fund grant. And I'll be joined by three of our awardees from each of our three years that will be sharing their experiences about the process so you can find out more information um, then as well. And um, just in general, you can also um, contact our grants department, let them know that you have a project that you're interested in that, that is um, of an African-American site or place, feel free to email me at lmore at savingplaces.org. I'll be happy to answer questions that you might have. And with that, actually, I'll go ahead and Thank you all for coming and um, I'll turn it over to our Action Fund fellow, journalist Brianna Rhodes, who will share more about the work that she's doing for the Action Fund to help to share the full stories of these sites. Thank you. Anna. Hi everyone, um, my name is Brianna Rhodes and I am the Action Fund Editorial Fellow. Before I begin to tell you all about um, the projects that I have worked on, I want to say that this has been a fulfilling and amazing experience over the past nine months. Um, I have spoken to great people and have completed extensive research to tell the stories of these historic sites. This has been the most beneficial and influential commitment I've made towards my journalism career. And I feel confident that I am now a woman in preservation and a historian as well. So let me touch on a couple of stories that I've worked on over the past couple of months. Um, just to start off, um, the first story that I decided to focus on was the John and Alice Cotrain home. Um, during this time, we were at the beginning of quarantine and artists were learning how to tap into their creativity at home. I think this site is a source of inspiration for creatives who were making this adjustment and also giving them an encouragement to let them know that um, the effort to create is limitless um, to experiment with artistry. Um, the accomplished um, jazz musicians and composers used their former 1952 Long Island, New York suburban home, not only to escape from the outside world, but to cultivate their most iconic masterpieces from 1964 to 1973, while being surrounded by love, support, and more. John spent five days in isolation in one of his upstairs rooms with just a pen, paper, and saxophone to create his legendary piece, A Love Supreme. And the piece continues to inspire musical artists across, the, across various genres to this day. One of the highlights of this story was actually speaking to um, the Coltrane kids, which is Ravi and Michelle. And it was so great to hear about the touching moments um, um, while they experienced at the home. And one thing that stood out to me that Michelle said that she said that their parents were the epitome of a black love story. So I thought that was so amazing. And um, the fund will actually continue to provide assistance for um, the home and turning it into a cultural education center. 
Um, right after working on that story, I worked on a civil rights listicle and I focused on seven historic civil rights sites that exemplify the fight against racial justice. You all know in 2020, activists and protesters are still taking a stand in large part due to the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDay, and George Floyd, and many more. And for many around the world, these fatalities are emblematic of the systemic racism black people continue to face. Activism and protests are not new to the history of the fight against racism. And I wanted to highlight that and talk about the leaders from the civil rights movement who paved the way for those who are amplifying their voices today. And also highlight significant sites across the country such as AG Gaston Motel, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, and the other historic sites that I mentioned in the story that continue to tell the narrative of why all Americans should continue to fight for equal treatment. These places not only represent the history of that struggle, but also establish a framework for the contemporary protest movement. In specific, I want to highlight um, the Nina Simone childhood home that Brent uh, mentioned earlier um, during our talk. Um, I am a native North Carolinian, and um, this home is very dear, dear and true to my heart because Nina Simone is a native North Carolinian as well. Um, Simone used her voice during the civil rights movement to address oppression and racial inequality. Mississippi Goddamn was written after the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in um, 1964 in Birmingham, Alabama. And while I was interviewing Brent um, for this story, He's made a quote that really touched my heart and stood out to me. And he mentioned that it takes someone with influence to speak on behalf of a movement and speaking in reference to Simone. And she did that and she risked her career. And the bravery of a black woman during that period to stand up for justice is being modeled in the black women who lead Black Lives Matter. They are reincarnations of Nina Simone. The stories of the seven places that I highlighted still remain powerful today. And just like Brent, I truly believe that these sites remind us that we are the light bearers and the social innovators who have taken on the burdensome but beautiful road to shift national consciousness. The next story that I worked on was um, August Wilson Childhood Home. And you know, for many of us, we are inspired by our communities and our surroundings that ignite one of a kind masterpieces that you know may impact the world. And that is definitely what August Wilson did. And uh, one thing that I've highlighted as well in this story is about the celebrities and entertainers like Denzel Washington, who have donated money to help restore, you know, restore the house. Um, he's also collaborating with the Wilson family estate to make a series of motion pictures based on Wilson's body of work. And the trailer of Wilson's award-winning play, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, was just recently released, um, starring by Ola Davis and the late Chadwick Boseman, which will be out at the end of the year. Um, this is the last film Bozeman was featured in, and I want to say, may he rest in peace. After this story, um, I worked on um, a, a C.T. Vivian and John Lewis story guide. Um, you know, you all know on July 17th, um, the United States lost two notable trailblazers of the civil rights movement. And I wanted to ha highlight how both men dedicated their lives to the fight for racial and social equality for Black Americans. Um, the guide offers a look at the sites and locations that honor both Lewis and Vivian and their impact on civil rights. So I highlighted um, um, First, Baptist Church, First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, and that was the location when Lewis first met Martin Luther King Jr. And I also highlighted Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville, Tennessee, that was the location where Lewis and Vivian both spearheaded their fight for civil rights. And another location was the Freedom Rise Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. And the museum recognizes the fearless endeavors of the protesters who participated in the 1961 push to desegregate public transportation and seating. Um, another location, location was Parchment Farm in Mississippi. Um, both Lewis and C.T. Vivian were um, arrested and jailed at Parchment for disorderly conduct and disturbing the peace. One of the most recent um, um, projects that I worked on are the um, significance of the historic black neighborhoods across the country. When I tell you all, I truly enjoyed um, this project. Um, I took a lot of time to really create a listicle that highlighted these um, neighborhoods because in the 20th century, um, the first half to be particular, black Americans identity and their influence on the United States was very impactful. 
Um, in reaction to racist actions and laws during that period, Black neighborhoods provided a sense of belonging, serving as a space not only to garner wealth, but also to celebrate Black culture in, unique, in a unique and authentic way. And during this time, Black culture identity began to emerge, but you know, um, Black Americans were still dealing with Jim Crow, segregation, desegregation, and other factors. Many of these communities didn't last because of factors such as gentrification and outright racism. However, I wanted to, everyone to know about how these um, communities have full rich history and the um, particular sites that I highlighted were the Greenwood, Black Wall Street District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Haiti District in Durham, North Carolina, Harlem um, in New York, U Street right down the street in Washington, DC, Jackson Ward in Richmond, Virginia, and a few others. It's, what I want to say is that it's great to see the support for Black um, businesses now. Um, it's on the rise now, and that's why I came up with the idea to acknowledge these areas who laid the foundation or the blueprint for successful Black businesses today. Um, my most recent piece that was um, published, I think, I believe last week, uh, was a story gone on Black politicians um, who have paved the way for the current politicians that we um, recognize now. As we could prepare for the upcoming election, which has the chance of being a historic um, election. This year, United States Senator Kamala Harris became the first Black and South Asian American to run for vice president. Um, and I want to say overall, it's safe to say that I've had an um, incredible journey um, during this fellowship process. And I'm excited about the two upcoming pieces that I will end the fellowship out with. Um, this fellowship experience has made me proud to be a Black woman, journalist, activist, historian, and all of the above. And I'm forever grateful for the trust and the Action Fund team. And I hope that I can continue to tell amazing stories as well. Thank you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the end. Thank you, Brianna. That was fantastic. And thank you, Lawana. So at this point, I, we want to facilitate a conversation with you. And, and again, I hope that these three speakers that we were able to, to demonstrate the power of having African American professionals, whether in a traditional space like a preservation practitioner or a journalist like Brianna, that we all can contribute to the work of telling the full American story. So thinking about this year, pivotal year, we have racial unrest and racial injustice that has been most visible and and I know that all of us black white and beyond that we have been deeply impacted by the horrific kill, killings and murder in American streets. We also are facing a health pandemic COVID and I know that that has impacted a lot of your preservation projects I'm sure many of your organizations are struggling to sustain operations, retain staff, if you have paid staff. So I want to ask you a question and, and feel free to either raise your hand or, or show us in some way so that you can unmute and, and share. How have you responded? What has been your opportunity in these moments of crisis? Have you found new ways to be more creative, to leverage digital technology and programming to expand your audience and to increase your fundraising? Have you been more creative in the way that you think about preservation and the memorialize and memorializing ephemeral history related to the Black Lives Matter protest movement and beyond? I wanna hear from you about your preservation opportunities, or even some of the challenges that you're facing in this moment. Who wants to share? This will be a test case for bravery. Hi, Brent. It's Janie. Hey, Janie. How are you? I'm well. Hey, <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Well, I certainly want to share this because even though COVID has been just traumatic for all of us, it has also provided new experiences and new opportunities and new ways for us to 
preserve the great history of African Americans and to preserve our stories. So in South Carolina, we launch Black Carolinians Speak, Portraits of a Pandemic, because we, we found that in South Carolina, there was very little in the archives about the influenza of ninth, the pandemic of 1918. We didn't want that to happen again. It was not gonna be happen on our watch. So we have this project and you can appreciate this. When it was brought to the executive committee, I said, we have no money guys, but I'll find a few dollars. So we found $500 to launch, to, to launch a website we are collecting stories. We have now collected over 65 oral histories from across the state. Our goal is to collect over a hundred. We've collected artwork, we've collected diaries, we've collected um, stories from people and we are archiving them at the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. So, I found $500 to do a web page. Someone heard us heard me talking about it. We have got we have attracted more than $50,000 in the last 4 months to support this project. Brett, you know me, you know how I go after the money. Yes, you do. So, <laughs> Uh, and some of my colleagues, members of our um, foundation, our chair and our vice chair are on the, the, this um, webinar. So I want to publicly thank the National Trust. We are so indebted to you. That, tra that training that we came to just sparked us so much. And so I'm sure that Dr. Watson, who's on with us and our, who's our chair, and Don Dawson House, who's our vice chair, will sh share my sentiments and our thanks to the National Trust. We have great things going on in South Carolina, folks. Check us out at wegoja.com, W-E-G-O dot org. Thank Thanks, you, Jane. Brent. <laughs> Thank you. And you all can hear that Janie is a legend in preservation. Oh, I don't and know about that. Yes, you, you are, are <laughs> And she participated, the South Carolina African American uh, Heritage Commission Foundation, they participated in our six month preservation leadership training. And their goal was to raise $50,000 over that six months. They accomplished that. And you probably have seen in the chat that they've raised an additional 300,000, rebranded the organization, they're killing it. They are a shining example of the power of statewide preservation organizations to take a leadership role in, in preserving and telling this important history. So thank you, Janie. You are quite welcome, Britt, and thank you. My heart goes out to you. <laughs> thank you. Who else has an example of innovation during a moment of crisis? I'd like to go. Please, um, go ahead. So my name is Ariana McCow. I'm the president and uh, principal conservator of Zilani Glass Conservation, and I come to this as uh, someone who is hands-on preserving uh, different pieces. Uh, we primarily work on historic buildings, often churches, and in um, this moment, uh, in general, I don't like to put myself in the in the fore. I like our work to speak for ourselves, but I felt like this was a moment for me to speak up to our community, especially the stained glass community where people often um, perceive it to be very Eurocentric. Um, and so both in the people that I hire to work for my company and also reaching out to the people and the communities that we serve, um, I've brought myself more to the fore to say, look, look at the people who you are choosing to conserve your pieces. And we like to broaden the scope of the people who we're training. So we've been um, working along with nonprofits because I strongly believe in having interns that are paid to come work for us. 
um, and, and finding organizations that already exist that reach out to the community we're based in uh, West Oakland. So finding those young people who may not know about this as a, as a career path um, and uh, working on that. And I'm also on the board of the Stained Glass uh, Association of America. And I encourage the board to put out an actual statement about equity and who they reach out to. And um, through discussions with them, they said at the beginning, well, you know, we're equitable. Why do we need to state this? And after going through conversation, they were um, enlightened to, you know, you need to speak speak what you do because sometimes people don't know that's what you do. So coming from a different uh, perspective, but boots on the ground and, and would love to support and find more projects that we can work on. So my team isn't just working on a narrow group of um, things because I know there, there are lots of projects that we can conserve. We just don't know about them. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for moving that organization towards a space of equity and putting that, that ethic on paper and in writing. And thank you for the paid internships and creating yeah, space. Yeah. I, I sleep at night, right? Yeah. Well, I, I hope that you get to meet our colleague, Milan Jordan, who is the new director of Hope Crew. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of mission alignment in what you just described. You two should certainly talk. And then we gave our largest grant this year of $150,000 to historic Vernon AME Church in Tulsa, one of the last standing remnants of the racial massacre from 1921. And that $150,000 is funding the partial restoration of their stained glass windows. Awesome. Yeah, so maybe you can be connected to that project in some way. Would love to. Thank you so much for the time and for people listening. Hi, Brent. Uh, yeah. This is uh, E.J. Scott. We met in Virginia um, at the um, uh, Preservation Virginia Farm. You were our keynote speaker uh, that day. And uh, hi, Lawana. Nice to meet you. I just want to say that the graffiti that you showed in your presentation uh, where the gentleman was asking uh, how many times do we have to tell you that Black Lives Matter is has, is sort of my perspective on things? Because I believe that the reason um, that we're in this situation, I guess, is uh, of people having uh, difficult to understand our value is because of the lies and the propaganda that has been perpetrated against us over the years. Um, I have, as I, I took the believe I told you before, I work on telling the stories of ordinary people when they came come out of enslavement um, to know what they did in or once they first emerged from enslavement and how those families have uh, progressed over time. Um, there was, as you know, we were generally relegated to certain neighborhoods or certain streets. And um, where I live in uh, Virginia, there was a street called Liberty Street. Uh, there were two houses built on that street in 1870 and they wanted to tear them down because they'd gotten into certain uh, disarray. Um, I worked, uh, I consider myself an activist community organizer. So I got the community to um, show up at some city council meetings and demand that that not happen. What I found out in doing some research is, is that when the city of Manassas had applied for their historic designation for the city itself, they used those houses built in 1870 on their application. But when they, once they received the designation, they drew Liberty Street out of the historic district. 
So we demanded that they put uh, Liberty Street back in the historic district. And we also have a marker telling the story of how this gentleman escaped from slavery, went to New York, um, was paid a thousand dollars for his service, came back here and um, purchased 14 acres and started and built these homes that still exist today. Um, those homes, one of them sold for a hundred and four thousand dollars. And now uh, then um, recently it sold uh, after refurbishment, sold for 477,500. We had another one that sold for 115. It is currently on the market for $525,000. I think these are important things that we need to work at because this will help us generate generational wealth. And that's what we need in our communities. So I wanted to tell that story because I, I, I'm just so excited about it. And one other thing, just this past weekend, we dedicated uh, a, a monument to Jenny Dean, who was uh, built the first uh, school here is the Manassas Industrial School for Colored Youth. This was the school that allowed people to go beyond education from like the third or fifth grade, the first one, teaching them trades. Well, that is fantastic. And I just want to say that your story is, is, is a common story where we have to fight this kind of cultural inequity and, and advocate on behalf of, of our history to be recognized within the traditional systems of preservation. And, and you exemplify the power of grassroots preservationists. Like Thank we you. can fight against this when we, uh, when we are committed to securing equity for, for our history and for our neighborhood. So thank you for that. So in our last few minutes, I just wanna open up the, the floor to anyone if you have a comment or something that you wanna share, 10, 15 seconds, any thoughts about the future of the black preservation movement and work. And I also want to just acknowledge our allies that are here with us that work with us on the ground you know this multiracial multi-generational coalition of advocates it will take all of us to elevate the significance of black culture in american history and i thank you for for being part of this movement so in the last few minutes anybody want to hey, share an opportunity hi um this is tiffany perry and I am the chief of staff at Russ College. Uh, Russ is the oldest HBCU in the state of Mississippi. Um, I am very new to this role. And so I have only been uh, chief of staff now for about six weeks. And um, this preservation work is extremely new for me. I have a marketing and communications and operational um, efficiency background, but as chief of staff, I'm now juggling uh, a lot of different uh, priorities. Um, one of those being the restoration of the Mississippi Industrial College, which is another HBCU uh, that closed in uh, the 1980s um, that we have acquired um, as a part of Russ College, as a part of our growth. Um, so we have a new president as well. She's the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Ivy Taylor. And so just being on this call is so uh, inspirational. You all have shared a lot of great information, um, but I'm really looking forward to learning a lot um, throughout this conference about preservation, especially on HBCU campuses and kind of the work um, that can be done there. So thank you to everyone who really shared because as a newbie to this work, um, these types of conferences and conversations are very critical um, for us on HBCU campuses. Excellent. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for joining Russ College and providing your expertise. And, and I'm so pleased to hear that Russ College has a commitment to preserving and stewarding its campus, returning it back to its fullest glory. I'm sure you've been in touch with my colleague, Tiffany Tobert. It, yes. 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 Yeah. So Tiffany is a project manager for the HBCU Cultural Heritage yes. Stewardship Initiative. And it sounds like you all will submit a, a letter of inquiry, I'm hopeful. And that would be correct. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, if there's well, we, one more, I'd, I'd like to ask a question, uh, Brent, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm, I'm Michelle Robinson. I'm a professor at Spelman College, so in, converse, in the HBCU conversation. Um, I also serve as a community partner for the Historic Black Towns and Settlements Alliance. Yeah. Um, and we just recently um, came in contact with a community that's struggling with um, preservation of a piece of property that has been, for lack of a better word, swallowed up by a local um, um, institution. And I wondered if the National Trust offers any kind of legal um, sort of guidance for people who are in those kinds of battles. Um, this is something I haven't been faced with before. I've, we've been working in communities for about five or six years, just supporting um, the work they're doing to in preservation, but never in the sense that um, things are being sort of acquired um, mm -hmm. and, and stories being lost as a, as a result of that acquisition. And I just wondered if there's any kind of initiative like that going on. Well, through the Action Fund and just at the National Trust, we provide technical assistance in many different areas, whether it's legal advocacy, it's preservation and beyond. So yes, you should reach out, connect with my colleague, Lawana Holland Moore, and we'll be able to connect you to the right person internally at the National Trust so that we can learn more about what the real threats are and offer some guidance and for some solutions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Everyone, I just wanna say thank you. I trust that you will have a fabulous con conference. And, and again, it's just, it's beautiful to spend time and space with you as we uplift and celebrate the power of African American historic places in history. Enjoy your conference. Bye, everybody. <laughs>